have with us this morning Dr. Nirav Shah, the head of the Maine CDC, um, who's been heading the administration's response to the pandemic um, and doing a masterful job in that capacity. I think we would all agree that um, Maine has never needed a more uh, capable and, and strong leader of the CDC than in the past year, and we've been so lucky to have Dr. Shaw in that role. And um, I will also say that Hannah and I did very well by buying some shares in Dr. Shaw uh, last year when they were still affordable, and we had him uh, commit to being a member of the council and also to being a co-chair of one of our working groups, the uh, Community Resilience Planning, Public Health and Emergency Management Working Group. So he's been very much part of the, the process here, and uh, he's going to talk to us this morning about some of his thoughts and ideas about how the response to the pandemic um, has lessons for us that are transferable to our work on climate change issues. So Dr. Shaw, thank you very much for taking some time to be with us this morning and uh, for all your work with this process. Well, uh, thank you so much, Commissioner Director P uh, Commissioner Reed, Director Pingree. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Nirav Shah, the director of the Maine CDC, and I'm really delighted to be able to join everyone for a bit this morning. Um, I, I'm honored to be here and and provide a, a bit of a thought or a lay the groundwork for some discussion about what I see as some of the nexuses between the work of climate change and the pending work that's ongoing in connection with the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I'd like to thank, first of all, all of my colleagues on the Climate Council. Uh, in particular, as Commissioner Reed noted, a big shout out to the members of the Community Resilience Planning, Public Health and Emergency Management Working Group. Um, I, I don't think when, when that subgroup started working uh, almost a year ago now, I don't think any of us could have imagined a situation that would have put those three issues, communities, re resilience planning, public health, and emergency management into sharper focus than they are now with, uh, in connection with the work around COVID-19. I'd also like to thank my two, my two co-chairs, Judy East and Annie Fuchs for picking up a lot of the slack uh, as, as I've been focused on the COVID-19 work. And, and of course, give a big thanks to Rebecca Lincoln from the Maine CDC and Becca Bulos from the Maine Public Health Association for keeping the public health side of that work going. Uh, what I'd like to do today uh, in my short time is make three observations about that nexus between climate change work and COVID-19, and perhaps even look to some of the early lessons from COVID-19 and how they might inform some of the ongoing work around climate change. Uh, my three observations, one is a practical one, uh, the second is a bit more academic, and, and then the third is very truly pressing. So we'll start with the more practical one. Um, and, and that first observation is a simple, but I think important one, which is that the reduction of the number of cases of COVID-19 and reduction of carbon emissions in service of improving climate change, both at their base, fundamentally require behavior change, wide ranging behavior change across the entire public, across the state, across the country, across the globe. And whether in the case of COVID that entails staying at home and wearing a face mask, or for climate issues, encouraging greater use of public transportation and wiser purchasing decisions uh, and other carbon reducing measures, they both fundamentally require wide scale uh, behavior change. And I think all of us know that even from our own personal lives, behavior change is really hard. Even when you try to initiate your behavior change, it's hard if you've ever tried to drop a couple of pounds let alone behavior change that is recommended, if not imposed, by external entities, especially in some cases the government, it's even harder. For decades, for example, public health has tried to get folks to stop smoking, eat better, and exercise more. And our success, although it's been palpable, has been slow. It's taken maybe 60 or 70 years for definable, real changes to have been made. But what COVID has taught us, and what I think climate change can learn from, 
is that these wide ranging, life altering behavior changes that we thought, I candidly thought were frankly impossible months ago, are not just now possible, but can be widely embraced by wide swaths of the population. To quote, you know, no one greater than Mandela, everything is impossible until it actually happens. And in service of COVID-19, we have asked people to fundamentally change the way they live, the way they learn, the way they work, the way they play in radically different ways from just a couple of months ago. And what's been striking to me is the fact that folks have done it. Sure, we all read about folks that maybe you see at the supermarket who aren't wearing a mask. But what's really remarkable is that so many individuals are and that businesses have radically changed the way that they offer their services. Universities have significantly changed the way that education happens. And families have radically changed the way that they interact with friends. It's evidence that climate change work that entails the same types of behavior change, that behavior change can happen. So in that connection, COVID sort of provides us a roadmap that demonstrates that hard behavior changes can be accomplished. And in, in this case, with respect to climate change, transition to a less carbon intensive lifestyle is possible. And that we can effectuate really big changes when the size and the scope and the magnitude of the problem is both large enough, when it's obvious that the benefits are real, and, and I think this is the critical piece, when the rationale for those changes is communicated to the public with clear, consistent messaging. Now, of course, I, I'm not, I'm not um, blind to the fact that there is a glaring difference between COVID and climate change. COVID is a short-term, hopefully a short-term issue that arose very quickly with victims who were very clearly seen by all. Climate is harder, its effects are diffuse, and it's a longer-term issue. But candidly, my view is that is fundamentally an issue of framing and messaging, not a substantive difference. I think for many folks across the globe, across the country, and perhaps even in Maine, climate issues remain as pressing as ever and could rank for many communities just as pressing as COVID-19 issues. And what we've learned is that when we frame big issues as a matter of community responsibility and overall survival, our own people within the state of Maine can take big action and do radical things. So we should take heart in that. Don't ever let anyone tell you that climate action is not possible. To the extent anyone out there is saying that, I would recommend you point them to the amazing strides that our own state in Maine has taken with respect to COVID-19 and at least the preliminary successes that we've had. If we treated climate messaging the same way that we treated COVID messaging, the question is, could we galvanize even more people to action? That's my first observation. The second observation uh, is candidly and admittedly a bit more academic, but it's something that I think about a lot. And it involves the following thought experiment. Um, everyone uh, I'm sure is, is no doubt familiar with the situation that transpired many centuries ago on Easter Island, when the islanders of Easter Island cut down the last tree. And at least according to some environmental experts and anthropologists, the complete deforestation of the island led to an ensuing ecological collapse that, again, at least by some historians' account, led to the complete societal collapse. The question that, that I've always had in my mind is, what were the people who cut down the very last tree on Easter Island saying when they were cutting down that tree? Were they saying, hey, look, we're just we're just doing what we were told to be doing. I'm just doing a job here. Uh, were they saying, oh boy, I don't know if this is a great idea. Maybe someone should speak up and say this could have some long-term consequences. Were they saying, you know, this is a short-term thing, but technology will save us. No matter what you think that those folks were saying, if they were even saying anything at all, the warning signs were there. The warning signs were clear 
that that type of deforestation could lead to unforeseen consequences that could then lead to political and other disasters that did in fact ensue. In regulatory circles, this is a classic collective action problem. Everybody knew that there was a problem out there, but society couldn't organize itself in such a fashion to tackle the problem and to address the problem. The, the parallels between that and our current climate situation, and of course, COVID-19, are too stark to ignore. The signs were there with respect to the possible emergence of a global pandemic. For decades, administrations, leaders across the country, across the globe, hadn't taken that threat seriously enough. We're now in a similar situation and have been for years with respect to climate change. And I think the academic question that hangs in the air is, is what are we gonna say about that? Fortunately, we are in a state like Maine where we're not just sitting around saying, well, technology is gonna solve this, or you know what, that's a problem for other people in a couple of generations to sort out. I think we should take pride in the fact that we're not just sitting around cutting down that last tree, but rather taking action against it. Especially, however, in situations like this, Collective action problems are the most difficult to deal with when there's a high magnitude but low probability event. But as we get closer and closer to more definable impacts from climate change, the, the probability becomes higher and the magnitude becomes too high to ignore. The same happens with respect to preparation for global pandemics. One of the words that has been used to describe the COVID-19 pandemic perhaps more than anything else is that it was unprecedented. Perhaps that's true, but now it is no longer unprecedented. In fact, it's the opposite. There is clear precedent for what can happen when you fail to heed the signs that a global pandemic could occur. The same thing applies to climate change. There are clear and unignorable signs of what can happen if we ignore the threats of climate change on the horizon. So that's the second point, a bit admittedly academic, but I think a thought experiment that's worth all of us thinking about. The third observation that I wanted to make today is the pressing one, which is the, again, unmistakable and unignorable parallels uh, from a health equity perspective between the impact of climate change and the impact of COVID-19. What we've seen with both climate change as well as with COVID-19 is that they affect the most vulnerable members of our society. Both climate change and in, in, my, in my case with, with the work in public health and pandemics, COVID-19, it hasn't created cracks in society so much as it has exposed the cracks that were already, already and always there. Just in our own state of Maine with respect to, with respect to COVID-19, there are unacceptable disparities in the impact of COVID-19 on racial and ethnic minorities as compared to non-racial and ethnic minorities. More generally, the same can be said with respect to, to climate change and its impacts. Now, there are a number of reasons why these health inequities manifest, and each and every one of them is unacceptable. But what we've seen is that both climate change as well as COVID-19 have disparate impacts on lower income individuals, individuals who have been historically marginalized, who have been disaffected and disenfranchised, and as a result have borne the brunt of each and every one of the major health crises that we faced. Climate change and COVID-19 are but two of them. Whether we're talking about vaccine preventable diseases, chronic illnesses, or a number of other societal ills, these social determinants of health bear out and the folks that pay the largest and highest price for those are typically, and in this case, the most marginalized members of society. I know that one of the charges of the Climate Council is to address these health inequities head on. And I wanted to draw that parallel between what we've seen that is unacceptable with res respect to COVID-19 and what we could expect to see that's already materialized in other states you need look no further than the disparate impact of say Hurricane Katrina on low impact citizens of New Orleans to see the potential for the same 
uh, the same type of situation to play out here in Maine were a disaster of that sort to strike. So I'd like to, again, thank Director Pingree, Commissioner Reed, for, taking, for giving me some time today to share some of these observations, both with respect to COVID-19 and the work of climate change. We've got a long road ahead of us, but at least we are organized, we agree as to what the issues are, and I think there are things that the COVID situation can instruct us to do a better and more efficacious job with respect to climate. So thank you so much, everyone, for taking some time to, to chat with me this morning.